All right, so first, a quick review from last time. We were talking about atoms, and we were talking about hooking atoms together to make molecules. And out of hundreds of atoms, we really only need to pay attention to four of them, which are hydrogen, which can form one bond, carbon, which can form four bonds, oxygen, which can form two bonds, and nitrogen, which can form three bonds. If it makes it easier for you, um, you can rearrange the order of them and you can call them, you know, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon. And that way they're in one, two, three, four, right? See what I mean? Hydrogen, one, bond, oxygen, two, nitrogen, three, carbon, four. So if that helps you, you can remember them that way and go from there. And remember that we quickly get to where we don't want to have to draw all the electrons each time. And so once you kind of get the idea of those basic atoms, what we typically do, particularly in organic chemistry, is we start uh, just drawing the, uh, the first letter for the atom, like carbon with a C, and then we'll draw a line to represent the covalent bond. So you, when you look at this, don't worry, it gets a little overwhelming at first, but uh, we get lazy uh, as we draw bigger molecules and instead of writing out even all the letters, we start, we start drawing these rings that represent how the molecules actually occur many times in nature. They all, they'll form these rings. And basically, anytime you have a ring, at the corner of a ring, you will have a carbon atom unless they tell you otherwise. So for example, you can see right here that in that corner, there's an oxygen there. So they have to put that in. Um, so anytime you have a corner, you're going to have a carbon. And if they don't tell you otherwise, that carbon is attached to either another carbon on another corner or hydrogens. So that's another basic rule as we go. Now we're ready to learn basically our four macromolecules. So those are going to be carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. And really the first three are where most of the action is going to be uh, for us in this course. Um, so we're going to talk about those. And the way you're going to be able to tell them apart, I'll just give you a quick a couple of tips. When you have a carbohydrate, you're going to have a one to two to one carbon hydrogen oxygen ratio or really close to that. If you have a lipid, which is like fats and things like that, it's going to almost be entirely carbon and hydrogen and almost nothing else. When you have proteins, they're going to have these particular uh, smaller subunits called amino acids, which you probably heard of before. If you're into weightlifting or that kind of thing, you might take an amino acid supplement. So we're going to talk about what those are. Those are made up of actually two parts an amino group and a carboxylic group. So we'll talk about that. And then nucleic acids, again, we'll go over really quick at the end, but you don't need to worry too much about that. So a couple of the carbohydrates as an example that you should know. One of them, the first one being glucose. You're probably familiar with this. Uh, if you have anybody in your family or you yourself are diabetic, um, you know that blood sugar, uh, which is glucose, is one of those types of things that you have to monitor because glucose and pretty much all the carbohydrates are an energy source. And if your glucose level goes too low, you become hypoglycemic. And if your blood sugar goes too high, you become hyperglycemic. And neither one of those is very good. Um, glucose is one of those that forms a ring. So over here, you can see the same glucose molecule in a ring form. Okay. Now, uh, when we talk about carbohydrates, uh, one of the things that happens is sometimes we can hook two carbohydrates together, two smaller ones together. And that is a very common chemical reaction that we call dehydration synthesis where we take two of the smaller carbohydrates and we remove the water that's between them, like you see here, and that gives us this molecule where the two now are hooked together. We can also go the other way. For example, if you were to eat something uh, that had sucrose in it, for example, sucrose is table sugar. If you eat a candy bar, it has a lot 
of sucrose in it and what your body does when it goes inside your digestive system one of the things it does is it breaks that down and it splits and it adds water between those two molecules that's called hydrolysis okay and so when we talk about this uh, we can have smaller pieces and then we can have bigger collections of those the smaller pieces are called monomers usually and if we hook a bunch of monomers together we get bigger molecules such as starch starch is a what we call a polysaccharide it's a really big carbohydrate lipids come in all kinds of forms but again kind of easy for you to know because you've seen these before fats are a good example of those that so most people know that if you eat certain things that have fat in them, you kind of know what that means. So those, are, those are molecules that have a lot of calories in them. Well, what a fat is, is it's actually made up of two parts. It's made up of one part that we call a glycerol, which is this three carbon molecule here. And then we have the really the fat part, which is the fatty acids. And if you look at this group here, this carbon with a double bonded oxygen in the OH, that is called a carboxylic group. But other than that, you notice that there's these long carbon hydrogen chains. That's the, the, the fat part of it. And so a fat typically has three of those fatty acid chains hooked together. There are also lipids that are what we call steroids. Testosterone is one and estrogen is one and you notice they look very similar and pretty much all the steroids have the same basic structure of having these four rings and remember anytime you have a corner on the ring you have a carbon atom and if they don't tell you otherwise there's carbon attached to another carbon and there's hydrogen to fill up all the space is left. So if you were to draw this molecule out, you'd find it's almost entirely carbon and hydrogen. Another type of lipid that's kind of worth mentioning right now because it affects the cell membrane, which we are going to get back to at the very end, is what's called a phospholipid. And it introduces a new atom that we haven't seen called a phosphorus atom which has this phosphate group in it, but you don't need to worry about that part of it because you've got the, the phosphate head part there. But if you look down below, you have what are the, what we call the, the fatty acid part. We have those chains. And instead of three of them, there are two of them. And that phospholipid is important because if you look over here, this is the phospholipid bilayer it's the it's the cell membrane basically so remember when we talked about the organelles one of those being a cell membrane the cell membrane is mainly made up of those phospholipids this group are proteins and proteins are made up of amino acids again that's probably something you've heard of before and what happens with an amino acid is one here you can see that carbon with the double bonded oxygen and the OH again, that's that carboxylic group that makes a lot of things the acid when we use that term. And then you can see we have our nitrogen group are what we call an amino group. It's a nitrogen with two hydrogens. And each amino acid is a little bit different um, in what it has in this region here. So some of them, like this one has a C, H3, but some of them have bigger structures. And in living systems, there are 20 different amino acids, and they are all exactly the same except for that part right there. You can hook them together and form peptide bonds. Now, we're not going to worry about this part too much, but when you hook a bunch of amino acids together, it folds up into a protein. And proteins do two types of things. One, which is very, very important, is there quite often they function as enzymes and they allow us to build things and break things down okay so enzymes are really important because they control pretty much all the chemical reactions that happen in a living thing some of the proteins actually work as what we call structural proteins and that includes like keratin so keratin forms your fingernails
um, and your hair is primarily that protein there. So the last one, and we'll just briefly mention this here, is we have nucleic acids. Nucleic acids, you can just think of as one example of those include DNA. DNA is the genetic code. And why is that important? What's the genetic code do? Well, it codes for how to build proteins. So when we talked about the uh, nucleus of a cell, remember I said that's where the genetic code is. You might remember back uh, just a little bit ago, we talked about this blue fish and we talked about the cells in the fish right so inside the cells of the fish is the nucleus and inside that nucleus is the genetic code and that is what affects uh, the development of what proteins we can make and the overall outcome at the end Here we go. Okay, today we're gonna to talk about macromolecules. And in general biology, in bio one, uh, when we talk about macromolecules, I'm typically talking about these four basic macromolecules, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. Carbohydrates 
typically will have a carbon hydrogen oxygen ratio of one to two to one for every one carbon there's going to be two hydrogens and one oxygen there's a couple of tiny exceptions when they form rings and structures of that sort but for the most part you'll be able to tell carbohydrates from that one to two to one ratio lipids on the other hand are going to be almost entirely carbon and hydrogen once again there'll be a couple of minor exceptions or additions to the um, carbon and hydrogen but for the most part you're going to see lots of carbon and hydrogen proteins are going to have an amino group and a carboxylic group and also usually some other form of what we call an r group which means various things could be attached uh, to that point and then nucleic acids we'll go into more detail on these when we get to dna much later on but nucleic acids are going to have three components to them a nitrogenous base a phosphate group and a sugar we'll start talking about carbohydrates first and we'll talk about the smallest of the carbohydrates that we call monosaccharides an example of that would be glucose and you can see a glucose molecule here and you can also see a glucose molecule here in what we call a ring structure so those two really are the same molecule and if you count them up you will find that for the most part they have very close to or exactly a one to two to one carbon hydrogen oxygen uh, ratio next in the carbohydrates we have disaccharides and disaccharides occur when we take two monosaccharides such as glucose and fructose and we hook them together and we'll see this reaction a lot where you hook two molecules together um, we can um, one of the ways we can do this it's called dehydration synthesis where we have a an enzyme that basically removes the water between two molecules and then ends up hooking them together and then likewise going the other direction we will have a reaction called hydrolysis where we'll essentially add a water molecule between two and split them apart these are all controlled by enzymes and we'll see them often so uh, this is the first place i see it so i'll mention it now next in the carbohydrates we have the very large polysaccharides polysaccharides are made up of a whole bunch of monosaccharides hooked together if we were to break the monosaccharides down once again using that reaction called hydrolysis where we break it down we would get a bunch of monosaccharides one of the things that we'll see is a lot of molecules are built upon some repeating subunit of something and so if we have a small subunit we call that a monomer and if we hook a bunch of that same monomer together we get a polymer so some polysaccharides are made up of repeating units of a monomer such as glucose and that forms then a larger polysaccharide examples of polysaccharides include starch uh, which are found in plants and things like potatoes and pasta uh, glycogen which is a carbohydrate uh, that we have in humans and other animals that's used to store carbohydrate energy and then cellulose cellulose is a polysaccharide that is typically found in the cell wall of plants our next group are called lipids and there are a bunch of different types of lipids one of the types of lipids that you'll be familiar with are called fats and fats are made up of a combination of two molecules one of them being this molecule called glycerol and the other being this molecule um, that we call fatty acids and typically there are three chains of these fatty acids and when you hook them together you get the entire fat or in this case a triglyceride and so we'll see these um, as we discuss them more as well okay next we have uh, in the same lipid category talking about fats fats can be saturated or they can be unsaturated fats these are also terms you've probably heard before when we talk about a saturated fat a saturated fat is a fat in which there are no double bonds um, in the carbon chain uh, whenever you have a double bond it tends to bend the molecule a little bit so if you look at this unsaturated fat you can see the car the carbon double bond right here and that leads to a a sort of bending of the carbon chain there and so we have saturated fats and unsaturated fats traditionally um, 
long ago, it was thought that all fats are bad for you. Um, and then more recently, um, it became sort of known that unsaturated fats are actually good for you and saturated fats um, are bad for you. And even more recently now, where we're sort of analyzing the fact that some saturated fats that occur in nature might be very good for you actually. But the problem is most saturated fats, uh, many of them are, are altered fats uh, that don't exist in nature and we've added hydrogen to them uh, to make them last longer and things of that sort. And so a lot of food that has high saturated fat is usually high in some form of preservative and, and those types of fats end up being not so good for you. But either way, a saturated fat and unsaturated fat, it comes down to the presence of double bonds or the lack of double bonds as you see there. Also in the lipid category, we have molecules that we call steroids. And once again, steroids, the term steroids is probably something you heard before. Cholesterol is a type of steroid. All the steroids have this sort of basic structure you see here where they have these rings. And so this is what cholesterol looks like. You probably also heard the term LDL and HDL. LDL is a low density lipid. HDL is a high density lipid and we often call these the good cholesterol and the bad cholesterol. But in reality, there's only one kind of cholesterol and it looks like this. And what we're really referring to is how your body transports that cholesterol through your blood. And when it transports it in the form of what we call low density lipids, it tends to be relatively low in protein and the high density lipids tend to have more protein as you transport them and the high density lipid form of transporting cholesterol, that level is considered better for your health than having a high LDL level. But that's cholesterol. There I should also point out that when you see these ring structures, um, one thing that's maybe not immediately obvious, um, in order to draw these and, and save some time, there's some simple rules. Um, and that is anytime you have a ring or anytime you have a bend, um, it is sort of assumed in organic chemistry and in general bio, like we're doing here, that there is a carbon connected at that corner and that there are, if they don't tell you otherwise, there are two hydrogen atoms connected then to that carbon. So in this particular case, although you only see a couple of H's and an oxygen and an H uh, there on the other end, at the corner of each of those rings that you see there, there are carbon atoms that just aren't shown and it's easier to draw that way. That's what the ring structure means. If they're going to put something different there like an oxygen, they will have to let you know that by putting an oxygen atom there. So that is a shorter notation when you see these molecules that makes it a little bit easier and faster uh, to draw them out like that. Also in the steroid category, we have testosterone. You'll notice that cholesterol and testosterone look quite similar to one another, as does estrogen. So these um, steroids, these lipid steroids, are all quite similar in their very basic structures with those four rings and some modifications of those. Another type of lipid that we have um, that is not a steroid, but in this particular case is called a phospholipid. A phospholipid is um, going to be an important lipid when we talk about cell membranes. Um, it has two important components to a phospholipid. One is the phosphate group, and you can see that here. We call that the phosphate head quite often. It tends to have lots of electrical charges on it, so it binds to water very well. We'll talk about that later on. And then at the bottom, uh, you have what are called the hydrophobic tails, and that is the lipid part of the molecule. And those are usually a saturated fatty acid or an unsaturated fatty acid. And there's usually two of them attached to that phosphate head. So that's what it looks like, phosphate head. And then the, what we call the tails quite often are the lipid part of the molecule. Okay. Next group is we have proteins and, and proteins we'll go into more detail on as we talk about how they function. Um, basically, proteins are made out of smaller monomers, small subunits called amino acids. And amino acids are molecules that have a carboxylic group, 
and an amino group, an amino group. And you can see that here and here. And the way we take two amino acids and hook them together, we once again use that reaction of dehydration synthesis. We remove the water out between them and we form what's called a peptide bond between the nitrogen group and the carboxylic group of two adjacent amino acids and we hook them together and we'll go into more detail on that when we talk about protein synthesis and that sort of stuff and um, proteins are, are are very structured molecules and, and there are four levels to the structure we start off with what's called the primary structure which is the polypeptide chain or just a chain of amino acids and then what happens is those amino acids will then, based on whether they're positive or negative or neutrally charged, they will fold and they will form these smaller sort of repeating patterns. Uh, sometimes we call this uh, an alpha helix or um, a, a, a pleated sheet based on this sort of repeating pattern of folding that they have. And then within that pattern, the tertiary structure is that pattern continues to repeat. Um, and so you might have a couple of alpha helix folds and then um, a pleated sheet fold and then that repeated segment uh, can, can continue over and over again and then if you take that as a as a final uh, tertiary structure protein and the, uh, or tertiary structure um, single chain and then you hook that to several different groups you can get a full functioning protein that's the quaternary structure that's when you take say several of the tertiary structures and hook them together. That's what you're seeing in this case with the protein called hemoglobin, which is used to transport oxygen throughout uh, your body. Uh, proteins can come in different forms. Uh, we'll talk about them primarily in the form of being enzymes and enzymes are proteins that will speed up chemical reactions. Um, we have enzymes that break things down and we have enzymes that put things together. Kind of an easy way to think about it in the beginning is to think about, um, say, uh, an enzyme that you typically have in digestion called lactase. Lactase is an enzyme that will digest the milk um, sugar called lactose. And so that will break that down. And so in that particular case, the enzymes lactase and the substrate that the lactase operates on is lactose and the lactose then would bind to the active site and break that down. In addition to enzymes, we also have structural proteins and examples of those might be like collagen um, that are used um, throughout your bodies and tendons and ligaments and things like that. And also keratin, which is a major component of your hair and your fingernails. The final group of uh, macromolecules are called nucleic acids and once again like proteins in particular we'll do these much later in, in great detail later on but for now just to sort of define that group macromolecules that are nucleic acids have these three basic components they have a phosphate group they have what we call a nitrogenous base and there's some form of sugar and what nucleic acids are used for are making uh, molecules such as RNA or DNA. And so by hooking monomers of nucleic acids together, we can make a whole strand of RNA or a whole strand of DNA. And again, this will come up later on when we talk about genetics and we talk about protein synthesis, but nucleic acids are important for coding the information that results in uh, the genetics of life, if you think about it that way later on. So for example, later on, we'll talk about um, a person's skin color, or eye color, or hair color, and how those particular traits that a person has that you can physically see are related to genetics. And then the genetics, if you break that down, are going to be related to the sequence that we put these nucleic acids in order. So that's it for now. That's a good start for us to um, dive in more into um, our macromolecules and uh, we'll continue on from there. Everybody have a good day.